All right, here we go, here we go. Knicks Fan TV, the podcast with special guest, the Nick of Time Show. CP from Knicks Fan TV, my man Jay Ellis from the Nick of Time Show. Special What's going on? guest with us today, Jay Ellis, Mark Berman from the New York Post. He's been covering the team for the past 20 years on the beat. Mark, thanks a lot for joining us tonight, man. How are you feeling? Uh, doing great. Thanks very much for having me on, and you guys do a great job uh, with your show. The largest, the biggest off season in Knicks history is is underway. We definitely appreciate you giving us some time to talk about it. We have a, a ravaged and anxious fan base that is uh, eager to know what path this team is going to take by the end of this off season. Before we get into uh, Knicks in particular, let, let's talk about you. You know, you've been on the beat. 20 years now, and it seems like you started around the time when, you know, it, it was the end of the Ewing era. I don't know if it was a curse or what, but, you know, 15, 15 of those seasons were, were losing seasons. You know, Yikes. we saw a lot of uh, heralded acquisitions and debuts and a lot of unceremonious exit during your tenure. <laughs> um, so, so as you, you know, go back, and, and reflect on those 20 years, what do you take as uh, probably the most memorable moment uh, of your career covering the Knicks? Well, it's true that I once I started on the Knicks, it was a steady nosedive. I, the, my first season was the 99-2000 year, the year after the finals, and then they get eliminated in the conference finals, then the first round, and then uh, – Jeff resigns, and they've been a disaster ever since. But, I mean, there's been some nice moments. Linsanity was yeah. probably the most jo enjoyable uh, time I've had on this beat. Uh, you know, it only lasted, what, four, five, six weeks. But, and, you know, I'm in uh, Oakland now. I'm covering the NBA Finals, and I got to see Jeremy Lin, who really isn't playing in the playoffs, but he's on the Raptors, and we reminisced a little bit about those crazy days. In fact, uh, when we, we were talking in Toronto, that was the site of his memorable game-winning last-second three-point shot that was that really put the Linsanity uh, era onto uh, another level. And I remember that press conference in the morning shoot-around. We went into this separate room. There was maybe 100 journalists, maybe 50 to 75 Asian journalist. That was the most fun. And I was doing five to 10 radio TV things a day during those few weeks. It was really insane. And, you know, unfortunately it didn't last long enough. And, you know, the, the 54 win season was, was enjoyable, but it ended too soon in the second round uh, to Indiana. Anthony got blocked by Hibbert. And then the Knicks have really not been heard from again. It's been a tough time, but I, I would agree. Linsanity was, was certainly a hot point, you know, for, for the Knicks in that short time. I remember me being away from New York in, in grad school, and there were so many just casual fans, you know, and, and you mentioned the, the Asian contingent from a media standpoint. Uh, I had a lot of uh, Asian classmates who never really paid attention to the NBA, never really paid attention to basketball, who wanted to learn more about the Knicks and learn more about what Jeremy Lin was doing on the night and night out basis. So yeah, that it really seems surreal. Like almost it didn't happen. And I felt at the time I was like in a Disney movie. It didn't even feel real at the time. And now when I look back on it, all these years later, it feels like it almost didn't happen. And talking to Jeremy and knowing how his career had kind of, you know, fallen apart because of injuries. And, you know, he's, He's on the Raptors, but he can't get off the bench because he's not a really strong defender. But it's it just amazing how famous he was. And, yeah, there was a little crowd around him on the media day, uh, opening day of the NBA Finals, but nothing like it should have been. I mean, there wasn't even any Asian journalists around. I mean, he's kind of lost his, his big uh, reputation even in Asia, even though there's rumors – he may actually go to the Chinese Basketball Association. Let's take it to social media, you know, as, as part of, you know, the evolution of uh, journalism and, and media has been the rise of social media. 
the instant reactions, the instant takes, covering players' activity from a social media standpoint. How has that kind of changed the way you go about handling your job on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, it's become a lot uh, busier, a lot more active. You know, for instance, Kristaps Przingis, when he was with the Knicks, uh, we had that afternoon practice where Fisdale was talking about uh, Kristaps' rehab, and uh, he's really just light jogging right now. He hasn't started running, and and you know, you feel you're done for the day, and then at nighttime, Przingis tweets some Instagram of look, you know, of him sprinting on a track, and creates a whole <laughs> new story. So it that would never have happened in the old days without the players having their own forum to respond at any moment of the night or the day. So that's one form of the, uh, you know, the busy uh, part of the job now. And plus, you know, right after practice, just in general, the, with the web, you know, you're filing moments later, you're tweeting today at the press conference with Kerr, you know, he's talking about Clay Thompson's status and you're, tweeting it seconds later and it's just a different environment you know you like to save stuff for our newspaper but you know in this uh every second uh of the day media world you know you just can't hold anything for too long it is interesting how rapid and instant everything needs to be now how about with the fans you know back in the earlier days of media uh, you know, if a fan or, or someone was reading a publication or an article, they may, you know, write an opinion in, in the publication or they might, maybe they'll send a fax in with their opinion or maybe an email or maybe they'll see you <laughs> on the street. But now on Twitter, you know, you might, you might post a link to an article. A fan might not even read it, but they're sending you an immediate reaction, whether positive or negative. And, and we see it on the beat, guys on the beat, you know, catch some flack. Oh, Stephen Bondi for sure, Isola as well. How do you kind of handle that uh, instant criticism from the fan base? Yeah, well, you got to have the thickest of skins nowadays. I mean, I get brutalized myself. Uh, and that is a frustrating part you mentioned. I'll tweet a uh, link to my story with a little headline, and they start bashing the story without having read it. And sometimes they'll make a comment that's actually explained in the story if they just hit the the link but it's just instantaneous they see this one headline and they just react to it and and are nasty about it oftentimes but listen i i've never blocked one twitter follower if you can't handle the heat then you shouldn't be a journalist we you know (laughs) throw shade at athletes we need to be able to accept it and i mean i hear of other journalists blocking Twitter followers who are attacking them. I, there is not, I can't even imagine. I mean, I've been called a racist and stuff like that for criticizing Carmelo Anthony. I, I there, There's not one thing I could think of where I would block a Twitter follower. I mean, I just want them to read the story. And listen, I, a lot of times the stuff they throw at me is, is really egregious, but listen, they're readers and we want readers and I'm not blocking anyone. And again, I have a, a very thick skin and I think, uh, Hey, a journalist attacked me too. And I almost never respond once in a blue moon, but, uh, you know, Frank, I saw, and I, you know, we've known each other for a very, very long time. And a lot of it is, is joking, but you know, I, I don't go back at him and never have, in fact, I don't even follow him, but I hear that he has <laughs> nailed me a few That's times. funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll see it either like one of my colleagues will mention something or it, it may be retweeted, but yeah, I don't follow Frankie. That's so funny. all that is fair game? It is. I mean, listen, if I didn't know Frank on a personal level, I mean, it would be bizarre, but the fact that we've known each other and, you know, shared a a million cabs and, you know, been out to dinner. I mean, it, a lot of it, I mean, a lot of people think we have this crazy feud, but, you know, it, that's not true. I mean, it, it, sometimes it gets a little overboard with some of the stuff, but, um, 
you know, it, it's mostly joking. Uh, I was curious about the Bondi thing because I know Bondi posted something on about you, I think a week or two ago about the Kevin Durant picture. <laughs> yeah, and I was. You know, it's funny. I I do never respond to stuff, but that one I just it just was instantaneous. I was one of the few reporters who happened to be in the hallway when Kevin Durant, who has been invisible, emerged, mm -hmm. and you know he passed me by like. Suddenly, I'm walking down the hallway. He passes me by. I can't really get out my cell phone. I'm not going to anyway. I and mean, I said hello to him. And then he passes me by. So I took out my, my cell phone and, you know, just snapped a shot with him and the assistant coach, uh, Frazier, who's his workout guy. And, you know, it was, a, you know, it was a, the back of them. And Bondi <laughs> tweets out a nice <laughs> shot of their back. And, you know he's not covering the finals and I had a little retort and I saw it got a little reaction, but yeah, I, I rarely do that. It was just a spur of the moment. I, it was just ironic that he was knocking my photo from uh, far away in another country. Hey, it happens, man. You gotta, you gotta let him know sometimes, man. Sometimes you gotta let him know. I'm but, not uh, Bondi and I get along <laughs> for the most part. Do you get the feeling that the Knicks, are either high or low on R.J. Barrett? They have Morant higher on their board, and we've reported that. And I've also reported that even last season, coming off his freshman year, sort of a modest freshman year, uh, some of their scouts still had Morant as a first-rounder. Uh, so he makes a huge leap uh, as mm -hmm. a sophomore and – He's a special type player. I, I'm thinking that the Knicks feel that Morant, there's only so few of these type of point guards who are just so creative. And point guards now are mostly scoring point guards. That's the trend. But Morant is a little bit of a throwback, and he's very creative. I've only seen him play three times. Uh, and, you know, very impressed. I mean, you, you just don't see it. And he's explosive. He's, his defense is what the Knicks are a little concerned about. But with RJ, yeah. I think they really like him, and he could be a 20-point scorer. Uh, but he's not as unique a player as, say, a uh, Morant. But at three, you know, you got to go with him. Listen, they like Colbert's defense better than Barrett's, but Barrett, you know, has so much skill as a scorer – He's got to get a better right hand. Yeah, there's maybe some concern that, well, he's not a great outside shooter right now. Is he going to be able to get to the rim in the NBA like he does in college? But he's only 19 years old also. And yeah. uh, I think he's clear-cut number three. They ha they'll, they'll work out Jarrett, and they really like him. And they, you know, Scott Perry and – Mills, as we reported, they flew out to Oklahoma in the middle of a Knicks game just to catch him for one last time in the NCAA tournament. But listen, if they move back a notch or two or three and get a real solid piece, like not maybe a Kuzma from the Lakers or just something like really substantial, if they get blown away, yeah, I think they would trade back you know, two, three, four wow. notches, and hopefully maybe still get Culver or a Hunter. But um, – and then we have to see what happens with Memphis anyway. I mean, who knows? Maybe Moran just falls to the Knicks at three. So how likely do you think that would happen of the Knicks trading back? I, I took it as they're, you know, they're Scott Perry. They do their due diligence. They try to turn over every rock. And just to see the possibility, but I wasn't really taking those reports – that seriously but do you have a different view you know, I, listen they, this, what else are they going to do this is the time to work out these top five top seven players just in case maybe you don't draft uh jared you know uh, in june but in two years you're involved in a trade or looking to trade them or i mean you, you want as much information you can get from these incoming uh you know freshmen or rookies so you know, they could work out all these second round picks as much as they want, but when you have a chance to work out Culver, you work them out. And if they could ever get Hunter in there, uh, you know, obviously Taco, Be uh, Taco Fall is uh, going to be a second round pick, but they'll work them out Friday. 
but just because they're working him out does not mean that he's under serious consideration for three. I think maybe they want us to write that a little bit so the agent says, okay, Jarrett will work out for you. And that may be along the lines of what's happening with Memphis and the ESPN guy backing off on his earlier report that it was locked in on Morant and now the ESPN guy is backing off a little bit. We've been reporting they're leaning that way. But if you're locked in on Morant, then why would RJ even bother to show up and work out for you? And they're having actually trouble getting Barrett to work out for uh, in Memphis. Mark, let, let me ask you, another draft day tidbit that has been talked about has been Frank Nilakina. I mean, we've been talking about and hearing about Nilakina trade rumors um, since last year, you know, since yeah. maybe even last off season, uh, we do know that given their third pick in the draft, uh, from a salary cap standpoint, if they do want to eventually um, pursue two max free agents, then there may be a decision that needs to be made between uh, potentially trading Frank and also bringing back ISO Zo. Um, what have you yeah. heard in, in that regard? Yeah, I mean, we've been writing about Frank and draft night for for a long time, uh, right after the trade deadline, we started writing that, you know, look out on draft night because they're going to be active. And his groin situation uh, did not help him at all. Uh, he finished playing 40 games. They never got a real feel of him and Dennis Smith Jr., unfortunately. I mean, if they could have gotten those two on the court together, and that never happened they could have seen what they have as a tandem, but now they couldn't even evaluate that situation. So he makes $5 million next season. I think most of the organization feels he's a backup ball player at this point. They haven't been able to see that he's a starting point guard for sure. They haven't been able to figure out if he's even a starting wing player in this league. He's got to improve his three-point shot. Fisdale has said it many times. If he doesn't, then, you know, we're talking about a career backup at best. So on draft night, $5 million that could affect their situation in signing two max guys and bringing back Dotson and Trier. So if you could get a late, uh, not late, but an early second round pick, guy making a million dollars or less than that next year, a, a guy you know, who could, you know, be a 10th man. I mean, I think the Knicks would, would like to do something like that, or even a late first round pick. Uh, Frank just did not show enough in his second season and Scott Perry did not draft him. Phil Jackson is, is the guy who thought he would be Mr. Triangle. So yeah, if they could get something for Frank uh, and clear some money up, they're going to do it. Uh, you know, Franks has spent a lot of time in France since the season ended. So uh, I'm not sure if he's back in town. I know a week ago he was still in Europe. Uh, it it bears watching uh, what happens to Frankie on uh, draft night. It's it's no uh, it's it's a real deal. It's a real situation. How likely do you think it is that the Knicks will actually trade for AD? I mean, they'll be in the mix. Uh, I think Scott had some good conversations with the old GM of the Pelicans, Del Demps, but he's been fired. And now David Griffin uh, is in charge. And uh, we witnessed Mills and Perry schmoozing with Griffin at the at the hotel uh, in Chicago. Yeah, that, was, uh, that was good. Yeah, work, yeah, that was great camera work. Oh yeah, you saw that photo. I did. I didn't get razzed by Bondi on that one. Yeah, I definitely um, did. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so they're schmoozing for about ten minutes, and uh, there was a report. Uh, I think today, and we've reported also that they hadn't started soliciting offers, but today, I believe one of the. A national websites reported that uh, Griffin is starting to now uh, take offers. His meeting last week with Davis seemed to not go well. Or, I, listen, if you're Anthony Davis, I, I don't quite understand it. If they win the lottery, Zion Williamson comes aboard, 
and you'd think that that may sway him. But then you look at the other side. Well, he would have to tell New Orleans now that he want, he's going to sign long term. Otherwise, New Orleans should probably trade him. And I think Anthony can't give that commitment. He probably loves Zion, but I think he wants to play in a, in a major market. He's been in what is now the smallest market in the NBA in New Orleans. So I do understand Anthony wanting a different fresh start. I feel badly for the franchise and I feel badly for Zion. I mean, here all this hype and then he gets, you know, the lottery happens and it's New Orleans and you go into uh, a situation where there's so much uh, turmoil. And so it was bad for the league, but I think the Knicks have a, a, a puncher's chance. I do think the Lakers and the Celtics have more assets. But the intrigue of R.J. Barrett, you know, being mm. sent to New Orleans to join his buddy yeah. Zion, maybe Griffin will think, hey, you know, that would, that would be a nice part of the package uh, to have R.J. and Zion together in the South, uh, you know, they got to sell tickets in New Orleans. I'm sure they are now with Zion, but you know when AD is traded, he he really needs to hit a home run here. Uh, David Griffin does. So let me ask you this: um, I know a lot of Knicks fans they really love Mitchell Robinson, and I, I believe the Knicks brass really love him as well. And but do you feel like including Mitchell Robinson in a package for AD is a deal breaker for the Knicks? I know a lot of fans would probably be heartbroken if that happened. Yeah, I don't think it's a deal breaker. Uh, listen, they've pumped him up quite a bit, but I mean, he still has holes in his game offensively. He took three jump shots the entire season. Uh, it, it would be painful to have him go in the AD deal, but the kids from New Orleans, uh, you know, they like him also. And I can't imagine Griffin doing a deal with the Knicks for AD and not bringing back, bringing Mitchell back home. I mean, honestly, I, I think they like Knox also, but I think mm. they regard Mitchell as a real defensive stopper type to replace AD. I mean, they, they're giving away their, their starting big man. So I, I think Knicks fans have to realize that, you know, Mitchell got a big opportunity because of the tanking situation but and he did very well and he put up nice numbers but it wasn't really he didn't exactly help them win a lot of games if any games i mean he 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 still got to do some work you know he's got a lot of work to do and yeah you know there were times he was out of position as well he blocked a lot of shots even at the three point line but he's still something of a project and i think the Knicks fans have to realize if you're getting ad a top five player in this league, you know, Mitchell is probably going to be sacrificed. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately we have that conversation all the time that, you know, we really get attached to our guys and we don't like to see them go. We want to have something yeah. to call our own and it's hard to let those type of players go. And um, I understand why, you know, yeah, Nick I, fans do I, feel like that. I, it's just that it, it makes perfect sense for New Orleans to, to want to bring home a, a local guy, you know, in this yeah. deal as well, because it's going to be hard for them to lose Anthony Davis. They really have to, to, they really have to, as I said, hit a home run on this trade because this is David Griffin's first move, major mm -hmm. move after winning the, you know, he won the lottery, but you know, that's just luck. He's got to really get the best package possible. And when Boston is throwing Jason Tatum at you, uh, you know, the Knicks are going to have to be competitive with their offers. Yeah. Now, do you feel like if we get a Kyrie, even though he's been rumored to go to, to Brooklyn or Lakers right now, or a Kemba, if we get one of those guys, do you feel like an AD trade is less likely to happen? Do you get that, that uh, inkling from the Knicks brass? Well, Davis makes a lot of money. I mean, even before he resigns, uh, in 2020, his salary is still 26 million or so. So yeah, he's yeah. going to be sliding into cap space. As such, the Knicks most likely are not going to have enough room to sign two uh, other max players. 
they would have to throw like the whole roster at New Orleans. And I'm yeah. sure New Orleans doesn't really want to take some of the uh, other guys. So, so they don't want Henry Ellison? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but actually, that's a good point you made. The Knicks do have a couple of uh, non-guaranteed deals that could be thrown into a, a package. Yeah. But the deal would have to be brokered before July 1st. They, there's a lot of trickery to this deal also, whether it – has to become official July 1st, or if it could be done on draft night, it all depends on, on that. But yeah, Ellenson did sign the non-guaranteed deal, so you could throw guys in there, uh, but they're, again, having, it's a non-guaranteed contract, so uh, it's good for cap filler. But yeah, it's it's one of those things where I think if you get Davis, you're only getting one other person. Hopefully it's Kevin Durant. Maybe Kawhi yeah. Leonard is going to give the Knicks a look. His uncle, as you know, is from New Jersey, and Ka- Kawhi at least has spent time living here in the metropolitan area as opposed to KD, who has never spent any time except a few days in the summer playing at Rucker or the Dykeman or whatever other rec- uh, basketball uh, leagues he's participated in. So uh, if AD comes, I can't imagine them having enough room to assign two other Max players. Oh wow! I, I, it's funny because I always thought that was a, like a pipe dream to have a Kawhi Leonard here because I don't know I always thought he he had his sights set on the Clippers and that was it. But yeah, I would well, love I would love it. Yeah. So in the scenario, if KD, all right, so Kyrie goes to the Nets or the Lakers, then you know KD doesn't have a partner uh, to come to the Knicks, so he gets cold feet can't get Kemba with him because Kemba just probably is just going to sign for the money. That's my belief. He's just going to mm-hmm. take, he doesn't have to take this entire super max from what I've learned. You could offer more than the max, but somewhere in between the max and the super max. Um, so Kemba stays. So KD doesn't want to come to New York alone. So he goes to the Clippers and then the Clippers don't really have enough room for Kawhi uh, or, you know, Kawhi, feels oh maybe uh i don't want to play with kevin i don't know how well they know each other i don't think they know each other well at all and then maybe Kawhi looks the knicks way i mean i i think the knicks have to be very open and they are i mean they Kawhi is on their radar and you know they they know a lot of things can happen as much as people want to keep saying kd's a done deal if he's not coming with Kyrie. It's not such a slam dunk anymore. KD has to be careful. As I spoke to Bernard King uh, 10 days ago or so, he said, listen, if I'm KD, you know, I want to come with another star. You know, I don't want to come alone because Patrick Ewing knows how it was without another star with him, and he never won a title. I was hoping the perception of the Knicks is changing now, and I would hope that that would help bring KD here. So how do you feel about the new perception of the Knicks right now? Like, is it helpful right now? Do you feel like it's garnering attention and getting us respect finally? Yeah, What's no, for a 17 and 65 team, they're getting better publicity than any 17 and 65 team in history. I think that PR staff has done a great job. I think there's so much hope because of the cap space, because of the third pick in the draft, because of the possibility of trading for Davis. You know, KD is going to look the Knicks way, whether he actually, you know, comes here or not. They still have a a chance, a real chance. But on July 15th, you know, if July 15th comes and the Knicks still haven't pulled the trigger on something important, and I think the fans will, you know, not be so thrilled. But in terms of the general perception of the Knicks around the country, uh, I think Fisdale has done a really good job in changing uh, some of the perception. He's a great uh, salesman, and uh, you know a lot of media likes him. And Scott Perry is well liked by media, so I think there is a a different perception about the Knicks. You know, Phil Jackson was kind of hated by some segments of the media, by many of yeah. his uh, colleagues, uh, NBA executives and agents and so the Knicks got so much bad publicity a lot of people took a lot of joy in watching Phil 
fail in New York because, you know, there's a perception that he, you know, is very arrogant and, you know, he won his 11 titles and wrote a million, uh, 11 books. So, uh, you know, so anyway, yeah, I do think the Knicks have a, a, a nice thing going, but that could change. That could change in a hurry uh, in later this summer. On, on the KD front, Mark, you know, I've never heard or seen so much confidence and speculation on a player um, leaving one team to another over the course of, I mean, we've been talking about this since last offseason, that this was going to happen. It, you know, you've heard Dolan go on like the K show and, and he's expressed his confidence. Uh, the new regime through lesser words have expressed their confidence. Do you, do you get the feeling that there may be some overconfidence here um, in, in terms of even acquiring two max free agents, no matter who they may be? Well, overconfidence in the media, maybe, but the Knicks are not worried. I mean, they're, they're, they're confident, but I don't think they're overconfident. They know that things can change. As Marcus Thompson uh, told me, he's the author of the new KD book. He said that, you know, the, there's still more information to be put into this algorithm uh, on which, you know, Durant will make his decision. Uh, you know, this new arena in San Francisco, you know, it, it's a factor. I mean, it's a, I'm going to be taking a tour of the arena later this week. They're, the Warriors are going to give the national media a, a tour of the place. So probably hoping we're going to be writing beautiful things about it. And, and I know KD is, you know, fascinated by the move to San Francisco. So the Warriors aren't dead yet. And let's see what happens when he comes back and how the team responds and, you know, and the Clippers are out there and there could be a sleeper team, the Mavericks or so I don't think the Knicks are overconfident. I think they are realistic that nothing is done until it's done. And James Dolan has said, we've heard, you know, positive things about what's going to happen this summer, but until the deal is done, you know, it's still, the Knicks are still, uh, not counting their chickens and they're going to explore again. Kawhi could be a factor that we probably haven't written enough about. And, uh, you know, there, there's still a lot of things going on. Listen, we thought Kyrie was a potential slam dunk and, you know, I don't know this, but I'm just hearing from Rick Buecher who continues to say that the Lakers and the Nets are high on his list, you know, not just the Knicks. So, you know, who knows? You know, Kyrie did grow up in West Orange, New Jersey, and followed that New Jersey Nets team that uh, were getting to the finals. So I know for a fact that the Knicks are not overconfident. Uh, I, I think they have a nice level of confidence right now. And one thing's for sure, we, we can't let these Nets fans have any more glory, man. It, it <laughs> oh, hell no. No. 40-something wins, yeah. playoffs. Being witty, coming at us. Yeah, I'm tired. Yeah, I had enough. Nah. Had enough. I'm already tired of being witty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, listen, the, the Nets have a nice fan base and they're passionate, but there's not enough of them. And I always, <laughs> uh, I was surprised that the move to Brooklyn did not gain more traction, especially with the Knicks so down. I thought they would win over more fans, and part of the reason is. They also, after initially making the playoffs a couple of years, they f fell apart, and uh, you know now they're back in it. So there's a new buzz. But you know when Kyrie Irving has to realize that winning in the winning with the Knicks and winning with the Nets is entirely different. I think he knows that, and maybe he wants a little less pressure than what the Garden would bring. Uh, mm. But you know. His father, you know, is from this area. You know, he loves the Knicks. I, I'm I'm surprised that if Kyrie chose the Nets over the Knicks, it would be surprising. But, you know, it, it has to do with Kyrie probably saying, listen, I want to win. And with the Knicks, maybe it's more of a risk. Not if he has KD. Right, well, of course. Right. Which is why it's a little strange that, like Kyrie is not waiting to see what KD is doing. Oh, and maybe he is. I mean, maybe these reports are not completely 100% uh, accurate. But there's a lot of smoke out there right now 
um, about the Nets and Lakers. And the Lakers thing, you know, we wrote it during the All-Star break when Kyrie was talking about LeBron and how they've repaired whatever breakage they had. And it would be quite a story for those two guys to reunite in Los Angeles, you know, the, the Beatles getting back together. So I could see that, but I would be a little disappointed to see Kyrie choose Brooklyn over uh, Madison square garden. But again, Kyrie is his own man. I mean, he's definitely a little bit of a wild card. He's shown his eccentric side. So nothing would surprise me with Kyrie Irving. Speaking of wild cards, who do you think uh, could be a wild card play in, in this free agency hunt that's not who I would consider the four Ks, who's not Kevin Durant, who's not Kyrie Irving, Kawhi Leonard, or, or Kemba Walker, or even Clay Thompson? You know, who yeah. do you think could be another a wild card pursuit there? Well, if he continues to excel in the NBA Finals, DeMarcus Cousins could start making some noise uh, in July. You know, before uh, the finals, he was sort of a big afterthought, you know, injury prone and not very productive. But if he and now he's got a big chance with all the injuries, if he all of a sudden becomes a 20 point, 15 rebound guy in these final eight days or so, you know, he's going to command something uh, during free agency. I'm hoping that's not the Knicks fallback plan. I mean, they have tried to look at him during the playoffs, but he got hurt. So, uh, you know, the Knicks, you know, we had done a story about how the Knicks were really sending a, a lot of scouts way more than usual to playoff games. Usually after the regular season, that type of pro scouting uh, dwindles, but with all the, so many free agents, uh, you know, for 2019, you know, the Knicks scouts were out in full force looking at uh, the playoffs. And uh, I know Cousins was someone, you know, they wanted to look at, but, you know, he lasted uh, one game uh, before he got hurt. Cousins is not the guy for us, Yales, man. No, nah, I'm, I'm not. Good, not yeah. High on a Cousins acquisition. <laughs> but he could really yeah. improve his stock because uh, if he never came back in the finals, I don't know what kind of contract he was looking at. Uh you know, he signed that one-year discounted $5 million deal just to play for the Warriors to try to win a ring. But going into the summer, if he didn't come back from this injury, you know, he, he would have been uh, – I, I don't know how much he would have gotten. Yeah, he certainly gave him a lift in game two. And uh, depending on what KD and, and Clay Thompson's status are for game three, you know, KD's out. So uh, depending on, on how much uh, injury concerns the Warriors may face, he, he could be looking at an even more expanded role for sure. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, Looney is out for the series. Durant's not going to be back for game three. Clay is iffy. They need DeMarcus uh, to really look like an all-star uh, tomorrow. And I think they're going to run a lot of offense through him. Uh, and it's going to be very interesting to see how he responds. I mean, he's still rusty and he's still not in great condition, but he played 28 minutes in game two and got the double-double and got six assists. Blocked a couple of shots. He was very well high into the plus in the plus minus ratings. So uh, he's a key uh, in game three. Absolutely, man. Well, Mark, we certainly appreciate the time you gave us tonight. As I said, you know, the fan base is there waiting on bated breath here every minute, every day, every second. And, uh, yes. you know, we certainly appreciate you on the beat, giving us the lowdown on what's going on and, and sharing a couple minutes with us. Uh, guys, thanks so much. I really had a great time, and uh, you guys do a great job with the show. Before we let you go, is there anything, any recent articles or anything that you want to plug? Well, I did a Larry Johnson uh, story on his four-point play, a 20th anniversary uh, piece on uh, that historic shot that has taken on a life of its own uh, 20 years later. So uh, June 5th is the 20th anniversary of the four-point play, and uh, it the story was running in uh, Wednesday's post. Sounds good, and we'll look forward to it. Certainly a memory that uh, a lot of us Knicks fans hold near and dear to our hearts. So, Mark Berman, mm -hmm. thanks again for the time. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. Again, I appreciate it. <laughs>